Zastanowimy się teraz, jak będzie wyglądać życie gospodarcze w nowych okolicznościach. Naszą debatę podzielimy na takie trzy 15-minutowe niespełna segmenty, rundy. 15-minutowe segmenty. The first will be the turmoil of 2020-2022. The speakers will talk about their experiences. The second round is the need for economic transformation towards sustainability. What do we need to do it? And round three, all participants will get the same question to answer. I will ask them to mention three things that will characterize economic life over the next year. The stage is ready. I would like to invite the, the speakers. Agnieszka Wojska, Deputy President of BNP Paribas, responsible for banking, uh, MSPs and corporate. Alicja Fratyka, economist, uh, author of Ciekawe Liczby, and Edmund Shane, Director for Investment BNP Paribas Wealth Management. Welcome to the stage. Applause, please. Take your seats, grab your mics, uh, make yourselves comfortable, and those of you who are watching you online, you can also choose the language option in the upper right, um, upper right corner. The panel will be in Polish, and I'm starting with the turmoil of the past two years. Madam President, the first question is to you. From your experience, from the experience of the bank, how did the last year's turbulence affect investment decisions when you look at the customer? and the bank. Well, the last uh, two and a half years were the whole lifetime, back and forth. It's really difficult to talk about a single trend. What is important, though, is that when COVID started, which was a completely unknown event, it never happened earlier, banks came to a stop. I had a feeling that our clocks stopped, and for many of our clients, the, uh, everything stopped after, while they were trying to adapt to the new reality. One immediate result was that we had the lowest in history demand for loans, so investment, because this sort of thing never happened uh, uh, before. Later, we could see how quickly the economy was adapting to the industry, how the demand was growing. The second stop occurred the, in the third and second and third quarter of this year when war in Ukraine tilted people out of balance because everybody says COVID is out, it will be super, 2022 will be fantastic, we are all optimistic. Then suddenly it turned out that what we read about in history books is happening now in Europe. And that was the, the third and fourth lowest readout in terms of demand for investment loans. NBP showed this in their survey. On the other hand, what we also see is that there's considerable demand for turnover loans, especially in the recent uh, periods. Investors are afraid of the long horizon, so they avoid long-term investment projects, but they are very much focused on making sure that their business is secure. So they increase their short-term credit lines, but you also see that the usage of the, these lines is up. This is also and this is the consequences not only of the war itself, but also of the change in the attitude in terms of stock from just in time to just in case. So we keep stock, we keep it close to be safe. This is also uh, the result of the fact that companies look for resilience more than to, to efficiency. So not one gram more in margin, but uh, in case of being cut off or one of the suppliers being out of business, continue with the business. Big, big comp corporations, especially automotive, but not only, show that the shortage of a single component can stop our sales. So this is a very clear shift in the market. And the third thing that I also wanted to mention is the M&A activity, mergers and acquisitions. COVID correlated with low interest rates. So they continued over into COVID. And there was a situation where was not so many, there were not so many investment projects, but it was a period when the M&A market uh, accelerated. In 2021 was, I believe, the, the biggest year in 
let's say there were the largest number of transactions of the highest uh, uh, amount. It was uh, 5 trillion euro in Europe. In terms of customers, did you see an increased resilience or uh, more calm in, in approaching investment decisions or looking at these things? Because pandemic lasted a long time. It went through different phases. There were attacks of different variants of the uh, or strains of the of the virus. Then there was there was war in Europe. We saw a, a missile drop, and when we were looking at the stock exchange, it reacted more calmly. When I was talking to my partners, my business partners, Polish companies, generally companies, are now uh, kind of clever and more flexible in terms of their uh, attitude to to um, obstacles. Recently, we were analyzing a situation where in, in this crisis that we're having now, because we can talk about a difficult situation currently, we are dealing with a sector of uh, businesses which is functioning best in years. Polish companies learn to collect, gather uh, cash, they learn to draw conclusions, and we see this looking at our clients, how quickly investment uh, was made in, in uh, energy saving uh, solutions versus energy intensive. I'd like to ask Mr. Edmund Shing about uh, wealthy clients. Uh, how did the wealthy clients react uh, or how did the turmoil of COVID and later affect wealthy clients and how they perceive financial markets? Okay, so hello everyone. Uh, sorry, this is in English because I don't speak. It's no problem. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, in response to your question, I would say, first of all, wealthy clients loved it because they got wealthier. They got more money. Why? I know, it sounds crazy, doesn't it? Because firstly, we had COVID. Nobody understood what was going on. But one thing the governments and central banks got right in the end was saying, my God, we have no idea what this is, but this is the first time probably in history that the economies have been shut down, that you've been told to stay at home, don't go to work. And governments thought, what do we do? How do we maintain an economy when people cannot go to work? And the answer was, pour lots of money into the global economy. And central banks also poured lots of liquidity into the global economy to support the economy. And it was very successful. In a way, we learned the lessons of previous crises. The number one thing in a crisis is don't wait to react. The faster you react and the more you react, the more action you, you, you perform to help the economy, the better. And for wealthy clients, that was great because, of course, first we were shocked. We said, we don't know what's going to happen. And in March 2020, all financial markets were a nightmare. But after this intervention by governments and, by, and from central banks, the market said, fantastic, things are starting to look better. And then we got a vaccine and things started to look even better because we could start to see a way out of the crisis eventually. And as a result of that, markets have gone up, up, up throughout the whole of 2020 after March and 2021. And of course, wealthy clients being invested saw their investments generally go up. Now, this year hasn't been so good, but you've had nearly two fantastic years and this year's been a little bit tougher. But overall, they've loved it. But this is not just wealthy clients. This is most households. Households in the US and Europe today have much higher levels of savings in the bank than they did before COVID, even now. And that's one reason why consumers can still consume despite inflation, despite high energy prices, because the money is still in the bank. It wasn't spent because when we were sitting at home, we couldn't spend the money in the shops. It stayed in the bank. Great for BNP and now great for consumers because now they can spend and actually that softens 
the slowdown in the economy. I'd like to ask an additional question about the wealthy clients and their reactions that you described. Do they pertain to clients worldwide? Or when you look at the map of Europe, Asia and America, you can see differences in reaction between the areas. Yes, there are always differences. Um, Asian clients are the most aggressive. When markets go down, they get most scared. But when markets go back up, they are the most aggressive. I would say, if we talk about some, let's say, my father's Chinese, Chinese, some of our Chinese clients, it's almost as if they decide to go to the casino. They're very aggressive. When markets go up, they want to participate quickly. The second is the US. They're not as bad, but they also remember, they remember they have the philosophy, in the long run, stock markets make you money. They make, it rich. They make you wealthy. So that as soon as the markets go back up, they participate a lot. However, in Europe, we're a lot more cautious. We are a lot more careful. And so we don't really believe it. We're always saying, ah, you know, it's going up, but tomorrow it's going to go down. Yeah, especially in Poland. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's everywhere. I, 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 I'm, I live in France, and they're the worst. They're the worst. They always think everything's going to go wrong. They never believe things go right. But the important thing to remember is in the long term, it is more profitable to be optimistic than pessimistic. Thank you very much for drawing this perspective. Very good intervention. And I have a question to Ms. Alicja Fratega about Polish consumers strictly. How did we cope with the pandemic? Maybe I'll ask differently. Why did we deal with the pandemic so well? What were the factors? It's true, Polish economy uh, uh, coped with the pandemic quite well, exceptionally well compared to others, but it does not result only from the fact that these billions were pumped into the Polish economy in order to, to keep the, the companies floating and offering jobs and having some savings. It resulted largely from the structure of the Polish economy. We're we are the type of economy that manufactures a lot. When we look at the share of exports in the overall GDP, it is much above the EU average. And it is much above such countries as France, Italy, or Spain. Those countries are more savings providers, tourist countries, and they were much stronger hit by COVID and lockdown than our economy. Where export, even in the pandemic year, was up. I'll just quote some data, like four percentage compared to 2019. And in 2021, compared to the pandemic year, 2020, it grew by almost 24 percent. So the share in the export of the export in the GDP is now above 50 percent. And we are a key manufacturer, uh, manufacturer of such goods as white goods, uh, uh, washing machines, Machine, fridges. We are the fourth exporters in the world of white goods. While our export hits include furniture and uh, anything for the household. Of course, we also have poultry and, and uh, food products. But I'll just focus on these top categories, which were of key importance during the pandemic. People stayed at home. They did not spend money on tourism. They didn't stay in hotels. They didn't go to restaurants. France, they really had more money left. Even if we look at the data, the level of savings in Poland in the pandemic year was the highest since accession to the EU 2004. And now I will surprise you, or maybe I won't surprise you. Now it's at the lowest level in 30 years. That's 2021. I'm assuming 2022, it'll be even worse. It's the lowest ratio among all EU countries in terms of the savings level. Let's go back to the pandemic year. People had more money, so they were buying 
new equipment, uh, furnishing the house? Do they stay at home? Or perhaps uh, the time is not great, so perhaps let's buy right now the equipment because I won't manage to do that later on. No, the inflation was not that high in 2020. This increased inflation happened a bit uh, later, so I would like to praise a little bit the Polish consumer that this is forward thinking, so bad times are there imminent. No, we went to, we switched to home office work and people stayed at home. They wanted to change their environment. This is not only Poland, but also the environment, uh, the, the Europe. We wanted to change the environment because we are the exporter of uh, furniture in Europe. So this was not only characteristic for the behavior of Polish consumers, but also uh, other European uh, consumers. They were buying the equipment, household goods from us, and the economy managed quite well. The fact that our economy is based on export and production in various areas, we are uh, very good in these sectors, this can be favorable for the future. Our export hit, uh, these are batteries and automotive sector. Uh, of course, we are producing spare parts, but we can adjust very quickly to the production of any spare parts that are needed for electromobility because we have this hub. Well, it translates into different sectors. We are not producing Mercedes, but we are producing batteries or some spare parts. We don't have a pack at football match, but we have great players going around the world spending money. So, yes, but this was uh, quite helpful for us because the economy was developing at that time. And uh, we can say that we are an assembly point, but this is not a bad thing because because we have a lot of automated processes. It's not like that uh, that we had before, that people are having some basic tools uh, with a hammer and screwdriver. These are hubs, uh, very advanced hubs with automated solutions. So we are very good at maybe not Mercedes production, but in different areas. We should be very happy about it. Yes, we are. Let's move on to second round. So we summarized our experience. Uh, uh, these two years, and people are going to note down what do we need to went with, uh, towards sustainability in our economic transformation. What do we need? What do the banks need to uh, take part in this economic transformation towards sustainability? With us, we have Jarek Roth. Uh, could you stand up, please? Thank you. This is the executive director responsible for sustainability. So if you have any questions, Questions, any detailed questions. So Jarek is here. Uh, he is going to answer any question from you. And now, uh, referring to your question, uh, I touched uh, this uh, imbalance and uncertainty when I was talking at the very beginning. And this is the first condition for the banks. We need some balance. We need some calm approach. Uh, the, the banking sector can manage uh, their capital and PNL, but um, the regulator cannot add more cases to carry because there are a lot of them. The banking tax, typical for Poland. Now we have exemption from uh, the loans, from paying the loans. Uh, so 20 billion just went out of the banking sector. So it's like one bank is lost through these exemptions from paying tax uh, for a certain period of time. We have EPS and the change of VIBOR. So this is not helping in our banking sector. Why am I talking about it? Banks calculate, and we calculate that by 2030, the scale of expenditure for energy transformation is going to reach 300, 350 euro. Therefore, a significant part will have to be borne by the banking sector because companies cannot do that alone. So to do that, we need capital, we need profit to provide loans for the companies. 
to jest dla nas so this is the basic Druga condition, the basic issue for us. Another thing, regulations as for sustainability. Now we have objectives. We want, we know what we want to do, but we don't know the pace, how the pace is going to be distributed among various entities and enterprises, uh, various parties within the society. Therefore, we want to do something on the market that is not really fully regulated in terms of principles. So all the stakeholders understand it differently. We have rating. Uh, 160 rating agencies providing green rating, we don't have like a common denominator, where is green and greenwashing. The um, border is, is uh, rather thin, so the stability in terms of regulation would be helpful. And the third thing, the situation regarding smaller enterprises here we need uh, some support from the from the state uh, we need subsidies education here programs very structured so that in the economy uh, this can be adopted. Uh, fortunately, the education, uh, I was talking about it, that education of young people, uh, well, we talked about it, we talked about saving that, um, of course, we were joking a little bit that a daughter sent a, a man to me and uh, there was a question, where do you keep your money, in cash or in the bank? And the answer was in the memory. So it's good that the education is there because when I remember uh, my school years, we are not talking about it. Well, we don't have education about sustainability, but when we have the service among our clients, 70% of our clients say that ESG is not, um, is not affecting them. This is the issue for the state, big companies, European Union, this is not their problem. So it's like a race through short-term profit and long-term strategy. Thank you. Now a question to Edmund Schink. What do we need of the global economy? What, uh, what does the global economy need to go through this economic transformation without any pain? So what is needed? The simple answer is there is no answer without some pain. Okay? Let's be honest. And we have I, to suffer. Not suffer, but we need to adapt. And part of that adapting is understanding that, firstly, we all have responsibility, not someone else, not just the government, we all. So if you believe you want your children to have a future, if you believe, you, you believe global warming is going to happen, if we don't change what we do, we all have to change, right? What do I mean? Think about this. Energy usage in Europe and in the world has been huge, grows every single year, every single year. Even the demand for oil in history has grown nearly every single year, except for two years in the last 40, right? And that's with all the investment we have already done in renewable energy. Still, oil demand grows every year, not just because of Europe, obviously, but because of the US, because of China, because of India, and that's going to continue if we don't do something about it. Now, two things. Firstly, it's a lot easier to save energy than it is to generate energy. So the return on investment on energy efficiency is much higher than building another renewable energy field or nuclear power plant or anything like that. It's much better to save the energy first. And when I go around, let's say I live in Paris, I had to take the taxi from the, my house to the airport at six o'clock in the morning. It was dark. All the lights in nearly all the buildings were 100% on. Nobody was inside. Yeah. Why? So education first. We mentioned. Yeah. yeah. Education, everyone must take responsibility. Secondly, we must, unfortunately, yes, maybe we do have to sacrifice some things, but it's not a bad thing. For instance, over 50% of all the car journeys taken in Europe are less than three kilometers. Three. That is how lazy we are. 
three. Come on, guys. <laughs> it's ridiculous. You can it walk. Is. You can it take is. the bus. You can take a bicycle, right? And there are electric bicycles if you're too lazy to do the work yourself. There is an electric <laughs> motor. We have lots of solutions, more and more. They're not expensive. And none of them need to involve using diesel or petrol, number one. And number two, when we talk about energy transformation, and we want to get away from coal and gas, obviously, definitely gas now, we were addicted to cheap gas, like some Polish people might be addicted to vodka. I know you all love vodka. It is the home of vodka. So it's the same for Europe. We love cheap energy from Russia. It's gone. So now we need to change. And I think we will with renewable energy, with perhaps nuclear energy, and a whole range of other solutions to get away from fossil fuels. But of course, let's be realistic. It will not be tomorrow, it will take time. But if we don't start today, we will never achieve the objective. So it's a combination of lots of different things, but it includes us, ourselves, taking responsibility, making some changes. Great, uh, I fully agree. Uh, and by the way, did you finish uh, Academy of Physical Education? <laughs> <laughs> no? <laughs> Because I did. <laughs> But I, I love this metaphor, okay. Uh, przejdźmy na polski uh, ponownie i teraz pani Alicja... Let's go back to Defratyka. English. And uh, now Ms. Agnieszka, uh, talking about education. Uh, yes, we need to change uh, our behavior, move uh, more often, eat better. I believe that during our conference we talked about it. I, I do not agree uh, to put this uh, responsibility for the consumer as for healthy lifestyle. When you go into the shop, you have a lot of sugar and salt on the shelf. And we are weak. It's like provoking uh, some people to commit a crime. If you are exposed to something, you behave e e ir uh, irrationally. So what is um, the behavior of the consumer? A lot is going on at this point. Uh, good and bad, I would say. But indeed, the inflation uh, is affecting all of us. The price prices of food go up. Uh, what you uh, talked about before, we should be happy that this rate of inflation decreased. Uh, this is a momentary decrease. We saw the data presented uh, in the first presentation. We are facing a very difficult times, especially in the food sector. The prices of food and beverages uh, in November went up by 23% compared to November last year and 1.6 within one month. This is a significant number. This is uh, felt by all the uh, uh, consumers and this is not affecting the poor, uh, but they, uh, they are affected uh, the strongest because they spend more of their budget on food. Even in, uh, um, let's say, senior citizens, they spend 28% of their budget, and in households general, around 26% on food. So this is a significant share in our uh, household budget. So with such a significant inflation, uh, people say um, this is uh, much more than what the statistical office is saying. Yes, we felt it differently. Um, uh, we, our behavior is different. This is what uh, Edmund was saying, traveling by car. So I don't have a car. I walk or I go by public transport. So I do not uh, experience the prices as people driving the car on a daily basis. But this is the same with food products. Depending on what you buy, what is your um, habit in terms of uh, food, bread, uh, pasta, or rice, the prices are different. So this inflation Um, people who have uh, less money, people who live from one um, remuneration to another are going to find cheaper products. They are going to 
uh, check whether there are some discounts. So if you hear, if you hear there is a discount because today uh, the bananas, for example, are uh, less expensive. If the oranges are less expensive, you are going to buy oranges. So a lot of consumers are going to adjust to these discounts uh, offered in shops. But uh, prices go up the fastest on the basic products, uh, the le least expensive products. Uh, the, the professor from the university was analyzing uh, the very basic products like bread, milk, or dairy products, and it turned out that during this, during one year, the inflation reached around 50% regarding these products. People who can see that the prices go up are going to change their behavior, their consumer behavior, when we talk about inflation. So this is like the uh, average portfolio of products calculated what people buy within one year. So this portfolio does not reflect exactly what we are buying right now because we are adjusting to what is less expensive and what we want to buy. And these more expensive products, eco products uh, from the top shelf, they were always expensive, but these prices do not go up so fast because there was this market margin, these products, um, well, that was very diplomatic, eco products with a more significant margin, okay. We were, experience, we were doing some experiments, how the producers uh, define eco. So this is a discussion for a different panel, and these top shelf products, here these prices do not go up so quickly. When you go to a shop and you buy basic products, like cheese, for example. Cheese price uh, grew up really uh, significantly, but when we compare to these prices that went up, so the gap is a little bit smaller between the cheese and other products. So there is an opportunity to uh, take some of the clients that uh, were adjusted to particular brand or were loyal to particular brand, they are going to choose some other brand if they can afford it because the difference in price is not going to be so high. So here we will have like two-way approach. So some people uh, can uh, be attracted to some other products between be, because the difference in prices in terms of better milk and less expensive milk is not going to so is not going to be so significant so I will pay one lot or two more I want to know that this is ecological product so I don't have it's not bothering me uh, probably I am this client going into the shop and I need to buy these products so I am buying it I can pay more but I want to be sure that they are ecological products. But again, this is a discussion for a different panel, what it looks like. But I want to talk about the change in consumer behavior. People bought uh, the household equipment. Now, with such high inflation, these products are going to um, be given up. So people are not going to buy these products anymore because they bought it during the pandemic. And with such significant inflation, with uh, more, um, uh, with higher uh, loan installments, with such high inflation, they are uh, not going to buy these long-term uh, products like household goods, but they need uh, money for food, medicine, and for fixed costs. Uh, now we need to move into the third round, and we start from Agnieszka Wolska. Three things that are going to be characteristic for our economic life within the next year. Uh, well, it's difficult to predict, but uh, I can say that um, this will be variability, flexibility, and courage.
Odwaga kogo? The courage of whom? Courage, well, flexibility in our uh, variability in our economic uh, environment, flexibility in perceiving new solutions, absorbing these changes and new reality, and courage in taking decisions to do differently from what we did before. So courage to take decisions. Grzegorz Kozieja in his presentation said that uh, if I understood well, we will see more clearly the tendency to take in, uh, very responsible decisions by individuals. This is what I lack in this transformation. When I look at transformation in energy, our behavior, I lack leaders there are no leaders leaders that uh, or authorities, let's say. Um, we uh, argue between ourselves, we look at people. So we have this uh, crisis in trust. So here we have the leaders I trust, but I'm talking about the media and the perception of media among uh, uh, our citizens. So uh, um, this information that we can see through the media is not um, um, perceived by society very well. So education here is key. So uh, courage uh, in taking decisions, flexibility and variability, three elements that are going to be characteristic for our economic life throughout the next year. Okay, so three things. Um, firstly, the circular economy. Don't always buy new. I'll give you a good example. I met an analyst from Taiwan, I was on holiday. He was on holiday in Portugal. I got talking to him, we were walking. And it turns out he's an analyst of semiconductors and mobile phones, okay? He said, don't buy anything newer than an iPhone 10. By the way, we're on iPhone, I think 14 now? So this, is, 14. this is four models ago. He said, don't buy anything better than iPhone 10. Inside, they're all exactly the same. 11, 12, 13, 14, nearly exactly the same. They look different a little bit on the outside. Basically, more or less the same phone. Okay? So, what's the story here? If you want an iPhone, you buy second-hand iPhone 10. Don't buy the 14. Don't be attracted by Apple's marketing. But 10 is not updated for some time. And these apps are not going to work. It's not going to be efficient as I want it. They do. Actually, the iPhone 10. I know. I know. I agree. I agree. But but they do actually. So okay. Może model 10 tak, ale czy już dwa? So. Be model 10, but uh, number two. Yes. So circular economy, this is one thing. That, What's the next? Definitely. The second one is um, infrastructure. With such a huge structural change in terms of energy, in terms of inflation, in terms of the way we consume, and the, even the way we work, we need new infrastructure, right? We have been underspending on infrastructure globally and in Europe for the last 10 years. Okay, now we need to change energy generation, energy efficiency, storage, transportation, even things like installing bicycle lanes so that people can cycle to work and not take the car. Simple things like that. There's a lot we can do, but a lot needs to be done. Money needs to be invested. And I think these are key areas where investors can make good money, particularly in commodity production. We are moving from a, a world where everything was easy to find and there was plenty of oil, of raw materials. Today, no. We have shortages of oil. We have shortages of raw materials. And even if you invest in new production today, it will take two to three years for the new materials to arrive. When you create a mine, it takes a long time before you see anything come out. Two to three years minimum. So for the next two to three years, it will be an excellent time for commodity producers of all types of commodities, including food, beverages. This includes them. They can make very good profitability at the moment because the supplies remain limited. And that is not going to change in the next one, two, three years. Not quickly enough. So that would be the second thing. The third thing I would say is that there are, after what has been a 
pretty difficult year in 2022 for investors. We now are entering 2023, almost, with a lot more investment possibilities, a lot more opportunities than we've seen for the last two to three years, in fact. It's like we've had a huge reset in the investment landscape. And today, I could look in all different asset classes, commodities, structured products, stocks, bonds, all of infrastructure, and I find opportunities everywhere. And this was not true 12 months ago. So I think it's a very exciting time to be an investor, as long as you are brave enough to grab the opportunity today. So this courage to take investment decision, this is the key. So the customers that are well educated and they know uh, the Warren Buffett saying, um, be greedy, invest when others are not so willing to do so. And now Alicia, uh, the same question. I will make a reference to Poland and the economic issues that will dominate next year locally. Number one is, in my opinion, inflation. It will be increased all the time and Polish people are going through an accelerated course in economics. I will make a reference to the need for economic education. There is no such subject at school, in the primary school, that will relate to economy. It only comes in in the secondary school, the basis for entrepreneurship, and that's very limited scope. We're teaching 17, 18 years old how to save money, where, while most young people at that age already have their own money. Inflation, 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 three things. Because of inflation, companies will also have to make adjustments, depending uh, on, on uh, uh, what's happening, they'll have to cut costs, uh, change prices. Inflation will be dominating, therefore, a lot of activities in the Polish economy. And the second thing that is a little bit related to it, but mostly related to the fact that we're going to have elections, there are going to be promises, uh, economic promises. Uh, I'm pretty sure that this will significantly dominate this coming year. There will be attempts to cope with what evil things are going to happen within the Polish economy. We're going to go through stagflation, so the reduced economic growth and high inflation. And how should businesses deal with it? For some of them, this is going to be a very difficult time. So this, together with the electoral promises and everything that comes with it, and number three is the energy transformation. We can't keep putting that off. We should have done it long ago. We've wasted the last years by not investing in uh, our uh, renewable energy sources. And it's not just that we're going to start it now. We should have been done now. That subject will be really very much uh, talked about by, I hope, all opposition parties. I hope something will start happening because the fact that energy is expensive this year, that doesn't mean that if the war ends by next year, we all hope it would. But even if it ends, that doesn't mean that things will go back to cheap energy that was before the war. No. Cheap energy is over. We have to shift to renewables. And Poland has an opportunity to really get things done in this area. We have a Polish inventor, Olga Malinkiewicz, who uh, 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 who, who makes uh, the, the photovoltaics printed on foil uh, in Poland. We have solutions. If we go in this direction, a lot of good can start happening, but that requires political will. And also grassroots activities by businesses, by your businesses as well, to take such action on your own towards an energy transformation to to start gaining more and more electricity from renewable sources and not hoping that next year coal will be cheaper thank you very much to all panelists very interesting conclusions interesting observations one would like to say that if education was mentioned healthy living more exercise may 
maybe not this year, not on the 17th edition, but next year, the 18th edition, we'll, we'll meet up uh, at 9 a.m. next day here um, at, the, at the pedestrian precinct for a six-kilometer march, quick march. Well, that's a joke, but that was just a reference to Edmund uh, urging us to, to, to exercise notes. But looking at history, how bad are escalators, right? Escalators? Thank you very much. Agnieszka Wolska, Edmund Schink, and Alicja Defratyka.